Good afternoon, and welcome to the Community Technical Assistance Center of New York. Our webinar today is the first one in a series of supervisory best practice webinars. Today's topic is on the supervisor's role in supporting professional development of the supervisee. Before we get started, though, we're just going to review a little bit of how the webinar system works, especially if it's your first time being on. Everyone is currently muted, and we're going to have a number of folks on this webinar. You can, however, communicate to us through the chat box. If you don't see a chat box open on your right-hand side, the bottom right, you can hover over your screen where the slides are towards the bottom, and you will see a little chat bubble. You can click that button, and the chat box opens on the bottom right. You'll be able to send any comments, answer any questions, um, submit questions, uh, any feedback through that chat box throughout the webinar. There will be times when we ask you to please respond to a specific question. That's where you can do that, and that's how we'll see it. There will also be times in which we may hold your questions towards the end, um, as we will have some Q&A time at the end. However, when you do chat, make sure that before you hit submit, that you choose in the drop-down, send to all panelists, so that we can all uh, see your questions and are able to answer them. The slides and recording will be posted on the ctacny.org website within a couple of days of today's webinar. And at the very end of the webinar, we will also have a short feedback survey that we ask you to please com uh, complete. It pops up once you close out of the webinar. Okay, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, our presenters. So we have Dr. Tony Salerno. He is a New York State licensed psychologist with over 30 years of public mental health experience in adult inpatient and outpatient settings. He is also the Mixover Institute Innovation Implementation Officer and has extensive experience in a variety of uh, practices and in implementation. My name is Dr. Lydia Franco. I'm the Director of CTAC and Senior Director at Mixover Institute. As a social worker, I have a number of years of experience working to enhance mental health services for children and families. Both Tony and I have particular experience and interest in supporting the workforce and quality care. Tony, would you like to start us off? Sure, sure. Just first of all, welcome everyone. We have been really so pleased with the response that we've received. We, I guess it was over 900 people who actually registered for this webinar, which we think is fantastic. And I think it really just tells us that for supervisors, you know, they recognize the critical role that they play in an organization. And, um, and, and really, we need to be real about this and recognizing that not all of you uh, have the identical kinds of like roles uh, and functions. Uh, organizations can decide you know, where they want you to put your energy and your time. Uh, and so there's a great deal of variation you know, around uh, the kinds of roles that you have. And oftentimes, you're juggling a lot of roles. You know, I, I have experience as a supervisor for many years, uh, leading a team in a day hospital and clinics and things like that. And uh, really, the, the, the amount of juggling one has to do, uh, both to kind of address the needs of the folks that you supervise, as well as the organization, right? So in terms of just recognizing, we recognize that there's a really wide variety of roles, function, and expectations that you guys are dealing with. Uh, the experience and expertise and credentials of the people you supervise can also vary widely. Uh, the time you spend on various supervisory roles and what your organization expects of you. Uh, also, organizations vary in their support, really, of your role as pro pro promoting the professional development. That is the idea that your, part of your job is to ensure the quality of interventions and practices and services that are being delivered. And again, organizations vary on how much they expect you to do that. Some organizations uh, vary widely in the quality and regularity in providing you with supervision and support. So we think that this is a really critical role, and we've, we completed a project that involved uh, sitting down with a lot of supervisors, about uh, 60 supervisors, in some intensive work that we had done. And we just listened a lot and got a, an understanding of what some of the challenges are. And really our job today is to, to see if we can, through a series of these uh, webinars, begin to present some ideas, m many of which we've really gathered through the experience of supervisors um, and be able to share that with you. And our hope is that you'll, you'll get some practical ideas that can help you in your, in your role 
So let's go to the next, I'll hit the next slide. So, um, so what's the main goal here, Lydia? What do you think? So the main goal, uh, similar to what Tony uh, was just talking about, is to um, whoever you are, so whether you're and whoever you supervise. So this is really talking to supervisors out there that you get an opportunity to learn well, at least one, if not more than one, strategy from some of the things that we're presenting today that you can use in a practical way with those that you supervise. And that could be any type of person that you may be supervising or whatever role they may have. We hope that these are some clear practical strategies that you can implement um, at least one right away. However, as we are just getting started, we wanted to get a little bit of a feel as to sort of where everybody stands around supporting um, the professional development of your supervised E. So there's a poll question that just popped up on your right-hand side. We want to ask, how satisfied are you with the amount of time you spend currently on directly supporting the practice knowledge and skills of your supervisee? I think that's, uh, I think there was, oh, sorry, I switched the poll question by mistake. So it's actually the one that popped up. What percent of your time is spent directly enhancing the practice knowledge and skills of your supervisees? Is it more than 50%, 25 to 50%, 10 to 25%, or less than 10%? Just hit submit when you're done, and we'll close that out just once we have enough responses. Okay, so you could probably close that out. And in just a second, you'll see the results actually pop up on the right-hand side. Sometimes there's a little bit of a delay as it calculates the results. Okay, so thank you. So a number of you were able to respond, and it sounds like most of you are around the 25 to 50% range in terms of being able to spend time directly supporting the practice knowledge and skills of your supervisees. Now, you, you saw a sneak peek of the next poll question. So we'll have this one pop up uh, very briefly. And now that you've told us a little bit about how much time you think you spend, how satisfied are you with the amount of time you spend, right? Is, are you very satisfied, mostly satisfied, somewhat satisfied, or not satisfied? So again, if you can answer the question and just hit submit as quickly as you can. That would be great. Okay, we're closing that out and the results should pop up any second now. Okay, great. So I think uh, we got some folks who were able to reply, and it sounds like around somewhat, although there's a couple of you that did say you were mostly satisfied. So it sounds like there's a potential area there for improvement in terms of the amount of time that you spend. Now we want to take this a step further, and this time we want you to use that um, chat box, right? So you can also X out of the poll if it comes up on your panel and it seems to be in the way and you can uh, make sure your chat box is open on the right-hand side. So if, now that you've kind of told us a little bit about the time you have spent in this area, what impact do you think your efforts to enhance the skills and knowledge of your supervisors had on their performance and outcomes? So tell us a little bit more about that experience and how did it directly help or support your supervisor's performance and outcomes? So when you type in your reply, make sure you send to all panelists in the dropdown and then hit submit. And then uh, in just a few seconds, uh, we should be able to see your replies. Great. And Tony, I think we have a couple coming in. Sometimes there's a little yeah. bit of delay. So some are saying, you know, they feel better supported or have better energy, more time and investment spent on their growth, 
means that they're more motivated. Help them to build confidence is another key thing. The qu overall quality has improved. I keep seeing, I see a lot of confidence, right, Tony? There's yeah. A lot I, of, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> with this align with is very much so. What you guys are saying is that, look, this is like really important that you play a critical role in supporting those that you supervise in their confidence and their skills in being able to deliver services in a way that really meets standards of quality. And the reality is you are it. The supervisor is in that critical role, really between sort of the administrative and leadership of an organization and those who direct line folks who are actually providing the service that brings meaning and value to any organization. And so it, we're very pleased to hear that you certainly see that connection. Now, one of the challenges we've always heard, of course, is you know the satisfaction with the amount of time you actually can spend doing this was kind of on the low end, right? It was actually the lowest kind of end uh, and being mostly satisfied, but there's a huge number who are really not very satisfied with it and or just somewhat you know, satisfied. So that yeah. is really an important issue. One of the things we wanted to do here um, uh, really at CTAC is to also begin to engage the leadership of organizations. So we've, we've also been involved in that. I just want to let you know that that we also recognize that engaging leadership in this conversation is a very important aspect so that you get the kind of support that you need in maximizing uh, your role as promoting and supporting the clinical skills and confidence. And you guys were really mentioning that over and over again. Thank you so much for sharing that in the, in the chat box. Yeah, so we have we have a lot of responses coming in. So thank you everybody for actively participating too. I think I just also wanted to highlight there's one person that said um, in particular that the time they spend, especially if they're new uh, providers, helps build skill. And if they're more experienced providers, it helps to maintain motivation. And I think that's also that's also key to kind of highlight that there may be differences depending on who you're working with. So thank you yeah. everybody. And please so, and please continue to use that chat box throughout the webinar to provide any comments, questions, or feedback um, as much as you can. That would be great. Yeah. I, I like the last comment because, uh, as we mentioned, we recognize that the folks that you supervise can really vary in terms of their credentials, their expertise, their experience. And one of the issues that comes up is, well, no matter what their level of expertise is, and we certainly don't make the assumption because you're a supervisor, and I certainly wouldn't, when I became a supervisor, uh, you know, I was, it was in my second or third year, and I was supervising folks who had higher credentials than I did at the time um, and, and had more expertise. The issue is whether or not I still, as the supervisor, have some role to play in creating opportunities for everyone that I supervise to increase and enhance their professional development. That doesn't mean I am the expert who tells them what to do, right? And that I have sort of the final word on what quality is. We don't make that assumption at all. So there's also, you know, the kind of um, uh, perspective and the kind of disposition and attitude that supervisors can bring. And, and Lydia, you wanted to share this a little bit with us? Yeah. Um, I think the, and I think this, this slide in particular kind of sets the stage a little bit for the supervision series, um, this being the first webinar, and also really for the role of professional development, and that we move towards a supportive supervision approach, right? Sometimes, um, especially in, in, in sort of settings where you may not, even as a supervisor, you may not feel as supported, sometimes what ends up happening is you're more of a police officer, right? That you're more of uh, just trying to sort of catch things that are going wrong, um, or, uh, you know, you're expected to provide more punitive uh, response. Um, however, what we want to do is create, and I think this aligns very much with many of the comments that we've been seeing coming up in the chat box, is that moving towards a supportive approach creates a learning environment, right, where you're really focused on improving performance and building relationships with your supervisees. Then you're more of a teacher, coach, and mentor than sort of a police officer or a monitoring kind of um, person, but that you're able to, you're still, you know, it's still part of the role to monitor performance, but you're using sort of the data, you're using 
um, your, your relationship. You're using different sort of strategies to encourage that collective problem solving with your supervisee, that you're consistently meeting with them regularly, um, and that you're providing as much support as possible. So just regular and consistent conversations and interactions is key. And that really creates an environment that is supportive and that allows learning to happen and that it's okay for us to be in this sort of consistent sort of learning environment. Um, I think we have this uh, interesting quote and it's targeted towards social workers, but I think we can expand it to anybody kind of working in our field is that supportive supervision is underscored by really a climate of safety and trust that is felt between you as a supervisor and the supervisee. And it allows the supervisee to develop their sense of professional identity, the combination of providing education, administrative, and supportive supervision is necessary for the development of competent, ethical, and professional, I'm just gonna say workers or providers, right? The key here being is to create an environment in which um, supervisees feel safe to share, to talk, to learn, and that it's an opportunity to problem solve and build some of that knowledge and skills. Yeah. Yeah, someone asked so a I question think, whether or not, yeah. uh, just excuse me, Lydia. No, someone asked a question, is this sort of similar to uh, reflective supervision? Yeah, so it's related. To, it's, it's similar concepts. I think they, they don't sort of compete with each other in any way. I think there's a number of things sometimes when I talk about reflective supervision, um, and we may kind of bring that up in, in other webinars as well. Um, but it's very similar, right? The, the idea being is that you're using and you're, you're, just, you're creating an environment in which to support some, that collective problem solving um, and, and that sort of openness and willingness to, to learn. So I think it's very similar and related. Great. And I think in above all else, it really supports professional development. And Tony's gonna talk a little bit about some sort of ways or framework around thinking about a continuum of professional development. Right, thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, Lydia. You know, we're gonna be addressing, you know, this is a whole series of, uh, of webinars. And so we'll have others that really strongly emphasize the concepts of uh, supportive or reflective supervision. So we're looking forward to, to sharing that with you as well. So I'm really thinking about all the different things that a supervisor can do that is associated and aligned with uh, promoting professional development. And, but there are different levels, right? Some are fairly, you know, um, general, uh, not very labor intensive, um, such as a uh, level one, which is, I just, you know, one of the roles that I play as a supervisor could be, I just let people know that there's stuff out there that they could find useful in the work that they do and is relevant to the population that we serve. So it's just a dissemination of information, tools and resources, but there's really no follow-up. You know, so you might mention something at a staff meeting, you might send uh, an email uh, to someone uh, that just gives give them some information about maybe a workshop that's coming up or modules that might be available, but there is no expectation that you know, you're going to be following up and see whether or not anyone did it. It's just the sheer uh, dissemination of some information that is relevant to the particular work that folks are doing. There's another level, which is disseminating information and tools, but, but you have follow-up, right? He said, oh, it's not just about me sharing information, but then I carried that through. Uh, whether through inquiries or at a staff meeting. And so there's discussion about it rather than just simply providing information. Then there's individual supervision on practice decisions or level four is structured peer group supervision when you're facilitating some case conferencing, right, or formal client reviews. At level five, you're at facilitating group participation in education and resources as a team with follow-up discussion and action steps and the highest level and the least observed level across the country uh, is direct supervisory observation and provision of feedback on performance. That's a very, very high level, rarely seen, and, uh, and at least from our perspective and folks that we've uh, you know, met with and spoken to, and maybe some of you have actually gotten to be at level six. And I'm gonna go through each one of these levels and kind of share uh, with some possible practical strategies that you can employ that is, again, in line with your role in supporting professional development of the folks that you supervise. So in dissemination of information, you can just do it verbally, uh, email it. You just hope somebody will read it, 
right? They may or may not. Uh, and the follow-up might be just really briefly discussed at next step meeting. So it's kind of like, hey, did anybody, you know that thing that I sent you guys, there's going to be a webinar that CTAC is doing on uh, engagement of family members, right? Could be as simple, you know, as that. But again, you're relying very much on the degree to which the supervisee is going to, you know, decide, well, that sounds like interesting, maybe I'll do it, or maybe I won't. Um, okay, so that's, that's, that's one particular level. Oh, sorry, let me just go back a little bit here. Okay. Now, level two, you do that, but you want to follow up on it, right? So now you're kicking it up a bit. And that is include the information as part of the formal staff meeting agenda. Okay, you know, I uh, sent the uh, information about, you know, engagement of families or around best practices with kids with depression uh, or, you know, new advances in the treatment of schizophrenia, whatever it might be, right? And you say, well, did anyone uh, listen to the uh, to the particular webinar or watch a particular module? Um, and you have facilitated discussion of that, uh, whether it was relevant and applicable. And that's, of course, if folks actually saw it. If anyone in the in the, your team may have seen it, you may say, then well, tell me a little bit about it. What did you learn? Uh, was it really relevant? Is it something that we should definitely uh, really encourage folks to to, to take a look at? Uh, and is it going to be applicable? to the work that we, we do. Do the staff want, guys want any more information about that? But it's still kind of left to the staff to use the information or not, right? If they decide to go forward, you may or may not have any idea whether or not that particular webinar or whatever the educational information is has had any, any effect on improving that person's knowledge and skill level in a way that they can actually apply in their day-to-day -day work. Now, level three, now that's where you have individual supervision on practice decision making and a review of high priority clients. So some of you may do this, right, where you meet with each individual supervisee to discuss high priority clients. And it could be that you're aware of some high priority clients or you're asking the person you're supervising, so, you know, what are you most concerned about? What are some of the high priority uh, folks that you're working with, and high priority, you know, everyone's high, everyone is, should be priority, right? But sometimes that really has to do with, like, risk or where there's, like, some urgency or a person might need some support or where the treatment isn't going well, and you're there to kind of facilitate a process of review, uh, even if you create just a time and place for somebody to spend a little time saying, okay, I'm really struggling with this particular client, uh, I'm not quite sure what to do. And it doesn't mean that you're now the expert who's going to come in and say, well, I know what to do, right? It's you're creating an environment so that professionals can engage in what is a very critically important part of professional development is reflection on one's work and problem solving, that when you encounter situations, you know, kind of stepping back a little bit and having a way of talking it out. Uh, advice or guidance from the supervisor is often the main goal for the supervisee, but really in this particular level, you want to go beyond the idea of just having some advice, but it's colleagues coming together, a supervisor and a supervisee, um, in really thinking through some of the high priority challenges and concerns around particular uh, one client or a number of clients. And of course, you know, organizations, they communicate very, very clearly, right? that one of the high priority issue is risk. And we just can't get away from that. That is sort of built into the, into the system and that often guides uh, sort of the practice decision. So that'd be like level three if you do that, right? If you currently, I do meet with my supervisees, we go over clients, you know, we kind of think it through, develop some strategies together. That would be, that's, and that's pretty good. That is pretty good. Level four, you're kicking it up now another little notch. And that is a structured peer group supervision via your case conferencing and formal client reviews. So now you're bringing in, it's not just one-on-one, -on -one, but now we're doing this through a group. Now, I've spent many, many, many years uh, supervising um, and facilitating case conferencing. And when I reflect on it now, I have to tell you, I'll be very honest with you, I didn't do such a hot job with it. I couldn't say it was such a great job. Uh, I didn't really have it so structured. It was sort of, okay, we kind of go around, so what's, what's on your mind and what, who would you like to bring up? And it really did focus a lot on, on risk issues um, 
And, you know, it's sort of like we just, we went through a lot in a very short period of time, but I, I wouldn't necessarily get a sense that this was directly enhancing, like, the knowledge and skills of the, the various practitioners. It, it probably increased some of our um, sort of problem-solving uh, strategies, the way we were conceptualizing particular cases, if folks had some ideas. So you had a lot of peer kind of group support. Fantastic. This is a pretty high level. Uh, but I, I must, when I reflect on this, and I was thinking about this in terms of my own supervisory style, it wasn't so structured. And I think there was some loss to that because it wasn't so, uh, so structured. So the, the, the um, organizing, facilitating these camps con conferences, the challenge of developing efficient and effective processes, right? Because we don't have often a lot of time. And how do we do that? And really, there was a particular tool that we came across that, I mean, I wish I had this uh, back in the day. Uh, I think it would have made the process uh, go much more smoothly. And also, a person needing to be prepared when they're presenting uh, some of their challenges they're having with particular clients that they're concerned with. So I wanted to kind of share that with you. And some of you might find this tool, be, yeah, that sounds like it's pretty good. And something very simple, very straightforward, that might be used to you, useful for you. So the SBAR is just a simple and effective tool. It's designed to facilitate communication among practitioners involved in the care of a client, right? And it doesn't matter what kind of setting you're in. Uh, and it really just facilitates the kind of conversations between clinicians, either in person or over the phone, um, when you can have communication between different disciplines. And, and it really is across settings to facilitate this kind of like conversation. So here's the, sort of a template that you can see and I mean, some of you might want to take just a picture of it. I think we can also make the, uh, these slides available to you. And what it says is in preparing, as you, let's say you're a practitioner and you're going to be presenting um, on a particular client that you're concerned about, um, is to think about the situation, brief, convey, immediate, I mean, why is this review like important and really identify that. That does require some thinking before you get into the meeting. I must tell you a lot of times my feeling was, People came in the meeting, and it was like, okay, who wants to talk about somebody? <clears throat> and it may not be the most effective approach. Then there's the background, right? Set the con only the relevant circumstances uh, to prepare details in advance. So what, what is it we really need to know in order for us as a group, right, as a team, to be able to be supportive and helpful uh, to, their, uh, to your colleague? And then the assessment, short and long-term goals. So what's, what's the short-term goal? What's the long-term goal? Uh, and what's getting in the way of that? Uh, are there resources that are available? What are the, the strengths uh, and what are some of the potential risks? This is like a really important one, the assessment around strengths in particular. That's an area that oftentimes doesn't get much attention and we're naturally drawn to what's not going well, right? What's wrong rather than what's strong. And I wanna make a pitch around that because it's an area that I know many organizations and I certainly really missed a strong emphasis, because we can get caught up on what's, you know, this is falling apart, there's some like real difficulties, and we kind of, we can, and it's understandable, we can ignore, right, and not really appreciate, well, let's, let's have a real discussion around all the potential supports, both uh, the, and the strengths that the person has who's struggling, and also the external resources and supports. What do you know about family? What do you know about the residents that they're living in? That's an area that I would say generally in my experience is often underrepresented and it can also be a huge source of support and strength that can actually be built on in order to help this individual. And then, so what, what, what are your recommendations here? What does the practitioner suggest? So in your own mind, what, what are thoughts that you have about next steps and what is needed from us? What, what is it that you would like to know uh, that we as a team can support you uh, in moving forward. Uh, so that's, it's a very brief sort of thing. I wish I had this in my mind as a framework, um, both when I was presenting uh, clients as well as when I was facilitating uh, case conferences. And if you're in that role, you may want to consider that. When we were doing some intensive training, we found the number of supervisors says, you know, I want to use this because right now when I think about our review of clients, it's really not designed in such a way that helps us to bring our knowledge together, to share knowledge that we have, 
to share the strategies that we may have employed. So that's where the team is, is really strengthening their collective sharing of their knowledge uh, and their, their skills. Uh, and again, that's all in the service of enhancing the professional development of the folks that you supervise. Now let's kick it up another level. And this is facilitating group participation and educational resources as a team with follow-up activity. Now, here's the issue is around follow-up, right? So let me give you an example. And some of you may have, may have done this. Uh, others might see this as a practical thing to do. But we recognize full well, right, when we have webinars, and I've probably done about 100 webinars in my, in my career, I have, like, no clue whether or not anyone has really benefited from the webinar whether they've taken information that is particularly practical and relevant for them and are able to apply it. Maybe with the next client that they see an hour after the webinar, they may see a client and say, wow, you know what I just learned in that webinar, I think I can apply it. But who would ever know that, right? And it's not organized really. And so this notion of having a team, and I want you to try to imagine whether or not this could ever happen in your current reality. So. Or I bring all my staff together to view a live or an archived webinar. It could be a module. It could be a TED Talk. It could be a YouTube presentation on practice relevant topics. And or, right, the idea of attending workshops and in-service trainings. So there's like an educational experience that we have. And I must tell you, in my experience, I've done this. Uh, I've gone to these sort of things. And the idea of follow-up, not so much, right? And what would follow-up really, really mean? That means that if we're all watching a particular module together or a webinar, or we've gone to a workshop, or we've had a in-service training, and I've gone through, I'm an old person, so I've had more in-service trainings, but I don't remember one in-service training that I ever went to where the follow-up would be the next meeting is, okay, we just had this in-service training, right? It could be on best practice, depression, whatever but the actual focusing on how you're going to apply that. So you're acquiring information, but real learning and professional development is not just the acquisition of information. It's the application of that in real life. So uh, the next step, right, a supervisor facilitates a discussion that includes questions such as the following, right? So did you find any of the information presented to be relevant to your work, to our work here? Is it relevant? Is there an opportunity to apply what we've learned with one or more clients in the coming week? Who will be able to apply any of the ideas presented? And what specific new approach will you apply? So now we're going into the point of saying, all right, you've acquired some information, but the critical piece is how do you cross that bridge from acquisition to really applying it? And that requires some thoughtful reflection and conversation. And the best you could find is where a, a one of the staff or all the staff say, okay, so we learned a little bit about feedback-informed treatment. This I'm just giving you as an example. And this is an approach that says at the end of every session, you can ask some key questions to just ensure that your session really aligns with the felt need of the client. So you can, I look, I'm going to ask two questions, which I typically don't ask at the end of a session. And the question might be, well, do you feel that we've really focused on the things that were most important to you? Did you feel heard uh, and listened to uh, in your, during this particular you know, session? Did you feel you know, comfortable and, and relaxed and that you could freely share with me what was really on your mind? And you could probably think of another set of questions. But let's say somebody went to a, a webinar or a workshop or a module or related to that. And then folks are in a group, and you ask folks, okay, so who's going to get a chance? Do you think it's relevant? Do you think it's practical? Is it something that you can actually apply? And then folks would say, you know what? I'm going to try it during this week, and I may try it with a few clients or all my clients. And then the following week, when we get together, I'm going to be asking about that. Say, okay, you know, we had that in service on getting feedback from clients after every session, and folks said that they would be able to do it. So, John, you were going to do it with several clients. Mary, you were going to do it with – you thought all your clients could benefit from that. Uh, and, uh, you know, Harry, you weren't quite sure if you were 
really wanted to do this yet. You weren't, you didn't think it really made some sense to you. Okay. So, you know, you're giving some, it isn't as if this is a mandate and you're ordering people, right? But you're offering this opportunity for people to go from the acquisition of information to its application. And then in the following week, that's the conversation around, so how did it go? Do you think this was adding value to the work that you're doing? Right? Or do you think uh, you need more information? Should we learn more about this? Or did it not really work with you? Or did you learn something, a lesson that you learned to trying this out? Now you're really talking about professional development that goes beyond the acquisition of information and it's getting closer to the applic actually applying that. That's a high level of learning. And uh, some of you might be in that. Now, this could apply, I give you one example, but you could apply that same model to any topic area, all right? So if you have an in-service training that's coming up that all your staff are gonna be involved in around some clin clinically relevant issue, the idea is, well, let me see, how could I follow up on this? And when we have a staff meeting where I raise, so listen, we just saw that, then we just saw that stuff on motivational interviewing. Uh, does anyone have any ideas of how you, any of those elements that you're going to actually be able to apply, do you think was relevant? Is it aligned with what you currently do? You know, all these sorts of facilitating questions, all designed to facilitate this process of learning and then following up on it uh, so that an individual is able to really plan for its application and then sharing it with, with others. It's a pretty high level. Now, in my experience and in meeting with a lot of supervisors, I can't say that we've heard from many who have uh, done this. You know, I would, I, maybe I could just ask a question right now. Does anybody uh, who's on the line, um, have any of you guys done a little bit more at this level five? And if you could just maybe chat that in uh, and let us know, did it, did it seem to be helpful? Um, and I think that might be, uh, you know, if I can just kind of get a sense of folks out there and those who might have been able to do this kind of level five type of support. Let me just give folks just a moment to, to kind of type that in. And uh, let's see, Lydia, it'll, it'll pop up, correct? Yeah, sometimes there's a short delay, but yes, if everyone okay. can use that chat box. Yeah, yeah I'm curious to know, great. I'm curious to know if folks have been able to kick it up to this level. Maybe some would say, well, I'd love to do this, but I would find it, it wouldn't maybe be practical or it'd be a lot of obstacles to actually doing this. Let's get a little feedback on this particular level, which is a pretty, pretty high. So we have some folks coming in saying, for example, that they did send staff to CBT training and then talked about it at a staff meeting. Okay. Um, I think some folks are not doing this yet, but hope to be doing it, it looks like. Great. Some say they have done it one-to-one, -one, but not necessarily in a peer or group setting. Okay. Uh, some folks do have sorts of internal sort of training institutes where they ask staff to share their insights and how they can use it in practice. Yeah, some say, yeah, you know, they wish they could do it more, but they don't do it as much as they should. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this again is, you know, we recognize that there, there are many factors in the organization uh, to the degree to which they either can facilitate this process in, with you as a supervisor, uh, or you're going to, you know, find some uh, challenges associated with that. Like, can you actually get people together? see a live webinar or get folks together to say, look, there's a module at the Center for Practice Innovations that's all around, you know, how to really practical strategies around addressing cultural factors in a person's life or suicide risk assessment, whatever, whatever it might be. There's, it, it, there's a powerful process in bringing folks together, having them gather information, the acquisition phase, and then really asking individual, it's a pretty high level of accountability. Now that you've learned some stuff, is this stuff that's relevant to your work and is it practical? And if the answer is this is relevant, this is practical, then the next issue is when are you going to do it? When are you going to try to, even with one client, that I'm going to apply, no matter what the topic area might be. 
and then sharing what you found. And it could be, I don't know, that assessment seems so long that I found it really challenging to be able to do it. In fact, I thought it was turning off my client. There's no guarantee, right, that what you apply, that the client necessarily is going to be uh, responsive to it, right, in the way that you would like uh, in terms of their readiness for that. Uh, but it's, it, that's what professional growth is all about, is I'm learning things, but if I don't apply it, what we know, and I'm a psychologist, so, we, you know, I did study, you know, the area of learning was very, very big, right? And how do we, and our memory systems, uh, not only do we need to encode something in our memory when we have a learning to acquire knowledge, but that's not the same as application. Application now takes a whole other level of cognitive skill. It requires some planning, when, with whom, where, and then it's reflecting on the outcome of that particular approach, that new behavior that you're trying out. That is really where professional development happens. And so if some of you do find an opportunity, I, I mean, I would be thrilled if some of you said, you know what, I think I can bring everyone together. We can watch a particular educational experience uh, that's very relevant for our population and then really get to that next level we're asking folks are you going to get a chance to apply this in the coming week and our follow-up meeting would be so how'd it go that's really kicking it up and it sounds like folks out there would like to do more of it some are doing elements of that already and that's really terrific so thank you okay so uh, as i just mentioned supervisor follows up as soon as possible to support the supervisees who acquired important information and plan to actually apply it and then asking the questions that I had just shared with you, right? Were you able to do it? What was your experience? What did you learn? Uh, okay. Now, now I'm really going to kick it up when we get to level six, and that is bridging the knowledge acquisition gap. So as I mentioned to you, um, knowledge is necessary, but it is not sufficient to develop meaningful competency. And knowledge will basically fade. It will fade over time. If it, is not, if it is not applied. And so we just know that. We just know uh, that um, it is going to be very susceptible to uh, just loss of, uh, you know, even remembering what that particular area was about, uh, what were the key elements of it. So timely application is, is really, really important. The closer that someone can apply something from the time that they acquired that knowledge to the time where they actually can practice it, so it doesn't do much good to te teach somebody the best approach to bowling and you should extend your arm and you go through all those descriptions and you, you watch a video on bowlers and all this kind of stuff if the person doesn't actually bowl. And, uh, and that's true for both physical skills as well as for cognitive or emotional skills as well. So the most common training and education resource uh, available today focuses on knowledge acquisition. We know that because it's easy. That's why there's nothing more uh, complex about understanding why is it that so much of what we call training is really knowledge acquisition, dissemination of information, because it's easy and it's cheap. Uh, now, how to close this knowledge to application gap is a practical challenge. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm very aware of what's going on nationally uh, through some of the work I do with the National Council of Behavioral Health in, in DC. Um, and actually, I've only come across really one organization that has thoroughly embraced level six. I mean, every single aspect of this. This is a particular behavioral health clinic uh, in, uh, in Utah, which has been able to thoroughly embrace and apply level six throughout its organization. So let's talk a little bit about, about that, right? Um, so you know, I just wanted to, you know, there are archived webinars and modules if you're saying, well, where can I find some, some stuff? Uh, Center for Practice Innovations, uh, we have a lot of stuff on our uh, website. Uh, so again, these are just things that you can then just use at any time that's most convenient uh, for all of you. So the direct supervisory observation and provision of feedback. Uh, now, we're, now we're really at a really high level. And if any of you do any of this, please chat in. Please let us know what you do and, uh, and what, were the, what was the outcome. Uh, so I, I indicate here around the use of audio tapes or actually sitting in on groups or joining individual family, the, the kinds of things that is really high labor. There's no question about that, right? So what do we know around supervision and coaching? Learning any new skill does not occur without feedback. 
One of the most consistent findings in, um, in the area of psychology is that feedback improves performance, right? Um, so trying to learn a particular counseling method, right, without feedback is like learning to bowl in the dark, right? So you can just imagine that, right? So you just, you're not getting feedback, except of course, actually, I think that was wrong in a way. I used to be a bowler. Uh, if you could hear the, um, uh, the pins, right, it has a different uh, sound when you're hitting a strike. Uh, you're hitting many of the pins than if you're kind of missing it entirely, just several pins. So even that, the hearing would be some feedback that can, can uh, approach that. Uh, so the self-perceived confident competence in delivering a behavioral health treatment bears little or no relationship, right, to actual practice proficiency. So in other words, what this is really saying is that when they ask practitioners to say, well, how, how good do you think, uh, how well do you perform, let's say, conducting a motivational interviewing process? Or how well do you think that you assess a person's um, adversity right around trauma-informed care or something like that? When you ask practitioners and then you actually uh, listen to what they actually do, uh, there's often a, a discrepancy, right? Uh, practitioners tend to over over positively overestimate their performance. And that's understandable, right? It just, you know, I think the way we kind of perceive it is we may use different criteria, whereas the practice itself may have some criteria that is much more detailed, right? We, our sense of it is that, you know, the client seems to be responding well, client seems comfortable, we're really sharing. And that for, for a practitioner, <laughs> including me, who spent many years in clinical work, gee, that's great, right? And then if someone was to actually look at it more closely and say, well, it wasn't bad, but it was pretty good, but here are some elements that you missed, you know, that kind of a thing, right? Okay. Uh, now, there's a whole bunch of stuff coming in. Lydia, do you see, is it recorded? I don't see it. Can you just maybe share a little yeah. bit of what's coming in? Yeah, so some folks are saying that they, you know, they try to sit in on groups, for example, or that they were maybe training their staff on certain things like MI, um, and they were able to do live observations, which they found very enlightening. Um, you know, I think that I think um, it sounds like those that can have tried at least every once in a while, but that there's probably a number that probably are, are, are finding difficulty in doing something at this level. Oh, yeah. Look, the fact that some of you are able to do that, to actually sit in on a group, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, one thing is just sitting in on a group and doing direct observation, but there's another piece to a level six of super, uh, supervision and coaching that I'll also share with you. But it's really terrific that folks, some folks actually get that opp opportunity to do so. I got to tell you, in, when I was an intern in 1980, I had more direct observation, people sitting in on groups, one-way mirror. I did audio tapes. As soon as I got hired, I never did any of that stuff again. Right. As soon as I was hired, like, okay, now you're an employee. You're no longer a student in, in, in training. So it's the notion that education happens at a very, very discreet time. But once you kind of get credential and once you're kind of like hired, then all of a sudden, uh, none of that. Nobody sat in any groups. I didn't really send in any audio tapes. There was no one-way mirror kind of stuff. There was no person coming uh, and working with me on a very complex, complex family. Now I was out on my own. So I think that's one of the things that we see in our uh, settings is that um, at certain points of time when you're like in the student role, well, that's fine. But then once you become like, um, you know, an employee, right, with a credential, then it's a whole different, uh, you know, ball game. Okay, thanks so much for sharing, folks. And uh, so we know from implementation research, training alone, I, mean, I don't want to make this point over and over again, but training alone does not result in changes in, in practices. It just doesn't. So training is necessary, but it's not sufficient. So here's one, one issue around accountability, though. See, now, accountability must be reciprocal, and that has very much to do when you're going to get really serious about developing the knowledge and skills of, uh, of workforce. Accountability must be reciprocal process. So from the supervisor, for every increment of performance that I demand, I don't like the word demand from you, that I want to support you in, right? I have an equal, uh, there's some, uh, some people chatted in that my voice is coming over kind of a little distorted. Yeah, I hear that. There's a little echo. Okay, they just seem to happen. Yeah, I okay. think you can keep going. Okay, okay. Uh, so for every, 
increment of performance that I expect. For you. I have an equal responsibility to provide you with the capacity to meet that expectation. Does that make sense? That if I'm expecting you to um, provide, let's say, a particular kind of assessment or to provide a, some cognitive behavioral intervention for children with, um, you know, young kids who have depression or anxiety. Well, if that's my expectation, then, and I'm going to hold you accountable to that, well, then I also have uh, being accountable for providing you with the capacity to meet that and the support to meet that. Likewise, for every investment you make in me as a staff person, I have a reciprocal responsibility to demonstrate some new increment in performance. So if I'm, you're going to have me, I'm involved in a training program of some sort, you know, it isn't like, oh, gee, that was nice. I'm glad I got a, a half a day away from the, um, you know, from my job so that I can go to this thing. But really, in many ways, we've invested in you. And so we ought to have some expectation that in that investment that you're also accountable for using that knowledge to engage in that learning experience uh, fully as part of your work and to consider it and to apply it in any way that really makes some sense. That's the notion of reciprocal accountability. I would say in my observations around like a lot of training, I don't think there is that kind of mutual accountability that I observe a lot. And if you do have that, that's fantastic. But I think that that's also an important, uh, you know, area. And it's like the absence of like blame in, into all of this kind of like approach. That this, we're in this together. We need to create opportunities for all of us to learn collectively. Next slide. Oh, I got it. Okay. Uh, so what's good coaching supervision? Well, as we mentioned, like the whole high levels of trust, uh, you have a, a sufficient dose of it. You know, it isn't like it's just once uh, a month or every once every six weeks that, you know, ongoing supervision towards professional development is not, is something that's ongoing, right? And there's a sufficient dosage of it. Uh, direct observation, that would be fantastic. Uh, you know, there was something, some feedback from direct observation. I'm going to say a little bit more about that. Uh, additional modeling of skills, right? And plan for incorporating feedback. So uh, let me just kind of summarize a lot of this. In many ways, good educational supervision and coaching is where both the person you supervise and you as a supervisor really enhance your, uh, your particular skills. And there's an emphasis on strengths. So if you're meeting with someone and you're observing, um, you don't start out in the expert role of, well, let me tell you what you did wrong, or let me tell you, here's my point of view. Really good education supervision starts out with, you know, how do you see it? I think that's an important piece, is that you give the person that you're supervising, they ought to have the first opportunity to reflect upon their performance, reflect upon their experiences. And here are just some questions that one could ask that does that, rather than being in the role of, I have just observed you and now I'm going to give you, you know, my, my uh, observations. Really, the learning process is most facilitated when you provide an opportunity for the individual to really engage in that self-reflection process. Uh, let me just say something about one, no matter what the thing you're observing, is to have a shared understanding about the shared criteria so that you avoid bias, right? One supervisor likes this type of thing in a group. Another supervisor likes another thing in the group. Another supervisor like, doesn't like any of those things in a group. And you can have, for practitioners, it's kind of crazy making, right? Is that, wow, this seems to change, be different depending on who the supervisor is. To avoid bias, right, it's like, do we have a shared set of criteria that defines good practice. That's it. And that I know what it is, you know what it is, we agree upon it. When you don't have that, then you've got like bias coming in and that could be a real problem. Okay, so let me just move on. I, I just have five minutes. I think I've made my, my point. Uh, so let, this is a very important quote, poll question. Was there one or more ideas in this webinar that you may actually be able to apply in the near future? So what I'm really looking for is whether or not we've helped you acquire information that you think is relevant so that you can actually take at least one idea that you've gotten and apply it. So the answer could be absolutely. I got, or very likely, I'm not sure, or I don't think so. I don't, uh, probably not. I don't think there's any idea here that I think that I can actually apply in even a small way. I'd like everyone to just respond if you can.
just do the check step. Uh, so we'll just, okay, the poll has ended. Let's just see what the response is like. Let's just give it another moment. It takes, it takes a little bit. Okay, well, this is very, very gratifying to us. It looks like no one said, forget it. You know, maybe one person's not really, probably not. And, uh, and I hope that's because it doesn't make much sense, but you're not in an environment where it'd be so difficult to do it. But most people see it as they can absolutely or very likely apply that. That's very gratifying to us because we, that's our hope, that you would find at least one idea here that you could apply and that would be enhancing to you and the people you, you supervise. Okay, so uh, we don't really have uh, too much time for questions, but one did come in. I think, you, I think yeah. we have a couple of questions, actually, okay. that I think we okay. could try to answer pretty quickly. Okay. Sure. Um, I think one um, particular that came in is, what do you suggest when you've attempted to utilize techniques like these, but the staff member is unable to be reflective about their work performance? Yeah, I think what you, you have to do is, the, the, the most important emphasis is to avoid being in sort of the expert role and that, you know, the individual, um, you know, kind of perceiving the individual is really just not being open to new learning. Uh, the person may not. They may be very sensitive to any kind of criticism. They may believe, look, I've been at this for a long time. I know what I'm doing and feeling insulted or offended, you know, uh, around these sorts of things. Uh, now, you're, gonna, you're going to encounter some individuals who may be very closed about it. That group in, in Utah I mentioned, they had that experience that some folks didn't want any part of this thing. And what they did eventually is sort of like leave. But I think the approach of like creating um, these different levels, uh, but some folks are going to be open to one, one of these levels and not to others. And I think you kind of like try to assess what is it that this person would be open to and then trying to tailor your approach uh, to that person's, you know, openness. And if they're not open at all to any of these opportunities, I think that's something that you then begin to address. Uh, you know, someone's asked, is there, sometimes you have the uncomfortable conversations. Well, that's one uncomfortable conversation, right? When you have to sit down with someone and say, you know, we, uh, you seem to be very, very close to, or not open to a lot of these opportunities around developing, you know, your own knowledge and skills. And that's an important part of what we do here in this organization. And I want to talk to you about it. So that, I think sometimes you get to that point. You can look at the various levels and see some people can be open to like level one and two and not so much to level five and six. Uh, and I think you start wherever it is that the person's comfortable and try to build from there. So I say, and I think similar to that, sort of that, that um, sort of motivation piece, there's somebody else that kind of um, just chatted in. What about the person's attitude is negative? And I mean, it kind of sounds how maybe the person is on sort of, or has compassion fatigue or is a little burnt out. So how, how do you kind of motivate staff like that to be able to engage them in this process? Yeah, well, that's a part of your assessment. You're trying to assess what is it about these opportunities? Does the person feeling criticized? Do they feel that this is a statement that they're not competent? Uh, or are they just basically in a place where they have lost a sense of compassion fatigue and commitment to the work? You know, we're gonna be having other webinars uh, someone chatted in and asked if we're going to do have webinars yeah. on how to have those difficult conversations, and yes, we will. And uh, and others, other uh, another part of the series is really to how do you assess and understand the impact of work on individuals, uh, for example, around their satisfaction, their commitment, their sense of compassion, to what degree might they be burned out or have, you know, sort of vicarious trauma, all these sorts of things. We'll have a whole webinar on that. Uh, and that may actually be the basis of why some individuals feel so, you know, uh, so um, closed off or uh, not open to some new learning. So I think we'll be able to get into that uh, as, you know, as we go along. But I wouldn't focus too much necessarily on the one or two practitioners who are difficult. I think sometimes we can pay a great deal of attention to those folks and uh, where our energy uh, which is another strategy, is to put a lot of energy and positive reinforcement towards those who are open to new learning. That can often have an, uh, an effect. But uh, these are cr wonderful questions that you guys have raised. So, uh, yeah. I, I, so I, just want 
I just uh, wanted to add a couple of things as we wrap up. Um, and so one is we have a series of webinars coming up, and I see a lot of folks sort of uh, chatting a little bit about having challenging staff. And so we are going to have a webinar on staff sort of wellness, uh, retention, addressing compassion fatigue in the next couple of months. So I think that also may be helpful for a number of you who are finding some challenges with staff in those areas. The next webinar in the series is currently up on uh, the uh, up on the screen, March 18th, on um, creating a high performance team and focusing on team building. We have on um, some upcoming CTAC events um, that have been announced. Sort of check our website, check your emails. Um, for a variety of upcoming webinars on a variety of different topics, and that we wanted to just take a second to thank you all for participating, for chatting. This is really wonderful, interactive uh, webinar. Here are our emails to contact us. If you have general feedback for CTAC, please contact ctac.info at nyu.edu. You can check out our website where our slides and recording will be posted in the next day or two. And as you close out of the webinar, there will be a feedback survey that pops up please, please take a couple seconds to complete that feedback survey and let us know what additional information you're looking for. So on behalf of Tony and myself, thank you so much and have a wonderful afternoon. Okay, guys, take care. Bye-bye now.